Well, we're in our 26th session in the book of Genesis. And I uh, want to do a short amount of review today. It's interesting that we remember from last session that the very day that Methuselah died, the flood started. And there was a 120 year warning that the flood was coming. And I can only imagine how difficult it was for Noah trying to build this ark and tell people what was going to happen when there had not ever been weather on this earth. And then there was a final seven day warning. And when that came, when that came, I can only imagine how hard Noah was trying getting the animals in and continuing to tell people. People must have had some inkling that there was something going on that had more merit than what they thought because no one else was saved. No one else was saved. They all turned away from what Noah had been teaching about God and about what was coming on this earth. And it's interesting is that uh, Methuselah, his father was Enoch. When Enoch was 65, he was raptured. He left the earth. He was one of the two people in the Bible that did not die a natural death. Elijah was the other one, and he was raptured as well. Enoch was given a prophecy through the naming of his son Methuselah. And his name reflects this prophecy. Methuselah is a combination of two words, muth and shalak, and it means to send forth, or his death shall bring. And indeed, the year that he died, the flood came. Now, Lam uh, Methuselah was 187 when he had Lamech, and he lived 782 years more. Lamech had Noah when he was 182, and the flood came in Noah's 600th year. So if you add these up, you got 187 plus 182 plus 600, and you get to 969, and that's Methuselah's age when he died. He's the oldest person that has ever lived in chronological time in, phys in a physical body on this planet. Uh, the Hebrew text that we looked at last week restated that the animals were again going into the ark. It, not, they weren't going in for the second time, but meaning that they were, um, it was stated again that they were going into the ark. And Jehovah God sealed the door. He closed the door. He sealed them against the destruction that was going to come on this earth. We are sealed as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ in his gospel. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit against the great tribulation that's going to come. And if we follow Christ and make him the Lord of our life, we will be protected from most of the bad things that can happen on this earth. Not all of them for sure. The Bible repeats itself for emphasis, and it did so relative to this prophecy that the flood was going to come, the animals were going into the ark, and it was. It was a short prophecy at that time, but it did come true. Uh, a lot of people will debunk the flood as never having happened, <clears throat> uh, or uh, not calling it a valid historical event, and I believe that God is just waiting for the right time in all of human history to reveal that ark someplace up on the mountains of Ararat. And next week I'll give you a chart of all the people that have tried and how hard they've tried and what kind of information they brought back. The essence of this whole story of the ark and the flood is that Noah trusted God. Unequivocally, he just trusted God. God told him to do something and he did it. He just did it. God's word is absolutely accurate in everything that it speaks to. It's not going to convince the unbelieving world. We can't fight against the unbelievers. And last week we looked at Proverbs 9, verses 7 to 9, telling us that we should not push the truth onto scoffers. You know, you can tell them the truth, but don't push it on them because a scoffer is just going to turn on you in retribution. We see that today in the political arena. We see that with our, our liberal people in the political arena. They get very, very emotional over issues and uh, get real angry and they mock people and so on. 
such is the ways of the world and we are to avoid that don't get in discussions with them don't push the truth Noah was in God's will and that's what's important for us to understand he was in God's will he was seeking God's will and he was carrying it out Christ said that he was the truth he is truth, excuse me. He hasn't gone away, but when he was here in the body, just before he left, he said that I am the way and the truth and the life. If we accept Christ and seek to follow him all the days of our life, it'll deliver us from much of this present world. And we saw last week in Galatians 1.4, where the Apostle Paul made that really clear. And it's important for us to realize that whole concept of believing and then trusting God and following him because that will give us the best possible life that we can have here. It just gets worse if you're not a believer and it gets even worse than that if you are a believer and you're not following God. You're running away from him because you will be harmed. You'll have a very difficult life. Now the flood came on the earth for 40 days, lifted up the ark, and the ark began to float the fountains of the deep were opened up, and the waters covered the highest mountain by about 22 and a half feet. It's 15 cubits. We don't know what the highest mountain was at that time. There's a lot of very strong evidence to suggest that the mountains and a lot of the geological formations we have now were formed as a result of the flood. But we know, for example, that Ararat, the highest peak in that range is 17,000 feet above sea level, so it'll be another 22 and a half feet above that. In any event, the ark rose up above the highest mountain about twice the displacement of the boat. So the boat, with everything in it, was going to come fall down about seven and a half cubits down into the water, and it wouldn't scrape anything. God didn't send the flood without a lot of planning and without a lot of engineering and a lot of design work and we are the beneficiaries of all the data that's given here to validate the historicity of this flood. It's true. If we don't believe in segments of the scripture and say well I want to believe this but I don't believe that. The minute you do that your faith is weakened and you're losing the protection of scripture. Because you'll stop looking at all of it as fact and you'll start being skeptical about all of it. So if you say, well, I can't believe in this creation account, but yeah, I know there was a Jesus and he was a nice man and I'll follow him. That doesn't fly with God. God wants you to take him at his word and believe all of it. Because if you don't believe some of it, your faith is going to be weakened in the other parts. And you will lose the protection that that scripture has for you. We have a huge problem in the greater Christian community. Their kids are getting educated in public schools where they're reading about and studying evolution as though it's fact. And creation is not allowed to be taught in these schools. In some instances, uh, people are going in and maybe have an after school classes or something to talk about it. But it's not coming from the kids' authoritative figures, the teachers. And hopefully their parents are teaching these things at home. Uh, most churches don't teach creationism. They don't even get into these kinds of things from the pulpit. And it's unfortunate. So if they do, though, you still have this dichotomy. You've got these kids that are seeing evolution being taught on one hand. And um, creation, if at all, is taught in their, in their um, church. Maybe they've gone to a Bible college. I know some of the best Bible colleges that used to be out there are now teaching evolution as fact. Unbelievable. <clears throat> I don't know how they deny the scriptures, but they try and fuse the two together and come up with a creation evolution. It doesn't work. It ends up corrupting the scripture. It just doesn't work. Trying to come up with biblical evolution and uh, the ascent of man and trying to validate the... Uh, Cro-Magnon men and so on that are absolute frauds and we talked about that earlier in Genesis. What people do in violation of the scripture when they start doing these things is they're trying to please men instead of pleasing God. God never says we, we evolved. 
He says we were made from the creation, and each animal was made after its kind. None morphed from one life form to another. In John's characterization of the chief rulers in the synagogue who wanted to believe in Jesus because they saw what he was doing, they saw his miracles, and some of them knew those scriptures backwards and forwards, and they knew the prophecies. They knew how the Messiah was going to appear and when and what he was going to do. But they were so afraid of their social standing in the temple and the powerful Pharisees that they wouldn't publicly admit that they believed that Jesus was God. Then the statement says they trusted men and believed men, followed men rather than God. The Bible says that we've got to openly believe and express this belief. It really speaks clearly to those that are trying to combine God's word with the worldly um, ways um, as if the two could be mingled. It can't be. As Romans 10 verses 9 to 11 talks about believing and confessing with your mouth. The closet Christian that won't say anything may not be a Christian, may not be a Christian. If you're afraid to say anything to anybody about being a Christian, are you really a Christian? As the Bible says, you will speak with your mouth. You can't help it. You have to say something. It's interesting as the text states at least 30 times in the passages that we've looked at over the last few weeks that the uh, flood covered the entire earth. It wasn't a local flood. If that were the case, there wouldn't be any reason to house the animals in an ark. They just would all ran to higher ground, but it's not the case. And God said that he would not bring the flood again, which we'll see next week when we get into the uh, last half of the 8th chapter and break into the ninth chapter. And if, and if he wouldn't bring a flood again, then he's probably a liar because there's been floods all over the earth, local floods. No, it was a worldwide flood. It's very detailed, <clears throat> the description we have. And as a result of the details that we have, somebody wrote it that was very close to the flood. The Orthodox Jews believe it was Shem, one of Noah's sons. For today, I want to look at Genesis 8, verses 1 to 14. And I'm going to read the text again from the American Standard Version of 1901, which says, And God remembered Noah and all the beasts, and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass at the end of forty days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent forth a raven. And it went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned unto him to the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And he put forth his hand and took her and brought her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him at eventide, and lo, in her mouth an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth a dove, and she returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dried. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dry." Now what's interesting is it's, the text starts off with God saying he remembered Noah. This doesn't mean that God forgets, although some people would view this, the people that look uh, 
uh, at the, the heresy called the openness of God would look at this and say, look, God can't remember. So he, he forgot. And, uh, well, it doesn't mean what it, it's not what it means at all. It's a Hebrew word, uh, vaizkor. And it, was, it means, and he paid attention, or um, and he acted on his behalf, or he took factors into account. It doesn't mean that he forgot and then he had to remember. God remembers everything and knows everything. Um, he uses this word in the scripture to refer to taking a situation into account as he moves in action towards that situation. When uh, uh, Abraham saved Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction, it was God remembered Abraham. God remembered Lot. When he rescued Israel in Exodus 2.24, he says he remembered the covenant that he made with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Though that covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, was made with Abraham and was passed down and we are the recipient of a part of that covenant today as the church. And we'll bring this out when we get further on in Genesis. But it doesn't mean that he forgot. It just means that he took these things into account within the way the Hebrews expressed themselves. God caused a wind to pass over the earth. And in doing so, he stopped the fountains of the deep and he shut up the windows of the heaven. Now, the Hebrew word for this wind or spirit is ruach. And it can be used in either way, the wind, ruach, or God's spirit. And we see this in Genesis 1-2, where God's ruach is moving across the globe to assuage the waters, to move them away from the dry land. It means that he's exerting direct control to end the flood. Now, Psalm 104 confirms this about how God ended the flood. Because Psalm 104, verses 6 to 9, says, Thou coveredest it, that's the earth, with the deep, as with a vesture. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down. Unto the place which thou hast founded for them, thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. So what this is saying is that God by himself caused the events to happen to flood the earth and to remove the water and move it back down into those caverns, the underground caverns where the water is. And you'll notice the parentheses, it says the mountains rose, the valleys sank down. We see this as a possible reference to the geography that changed during the flood. I mean the flood was a massive amount of water. There are some that think that there weren't any mountains here at all before the flood. And we'll talk a little bit about the structure, the components of uh, the, uh, the material that's in Ararat in a few moments. But the subterranean caverns, now you remember these from the first chapter of Genesis. When the waters left the earth, they went down into these subterranean cavities and the dry land appeared. Those cavities were the, the God giving his gravitational force to this earth pulled that water down into these cavities. And there's plenty of underground water now. If it wasn't down there, we wouldn't have people getting wells for us and so on. Well, there's underground streams, there's aquifers, there's a lot of it. And um, that water was released during the time of the rain to add to the flood. And God here is closing the floodgates, the windows in heaven, and he's stopping the water from coming out of those caverns and it's going back down into them. There's several geological theories to consider uh, that are all highly probable because of God's actions to end the flood. Uh, one is the atmospheric canopy that we knew covered the earth. Because the first chapter of Genesis talks about the, the canopy that's covering the earth. The um, Hebrews call it the rakia. The expanse, the spread, 
It's the difference between, if you remember back to the first chapter, the waters above and the waters below, when they separated, there was this rakia. And rakia is more than just space. The space that this rakia represents has a lot of interesting qualities, and some of those are that it can be torn. I, I don't expect anybody to understand this, but this is what the text says. I don't understand it. But if you were a particle physicist, you could understand some of the characteristics of the rakia. Because as far as we can see, in these bodies, the expanse is just, there's nothing there. Or you may say, well, there's gas, you know, there's air and its various components. But I can't see anything. But God says it can be torn. It can be worn out like a garment. It can be shaken. It can be burnt up. It can be split apart like a scroll. And it can be rolled up like a mantle. The rakia has characteristics. During the Great Tribulation, a lot of these characteristics are going to be activated to cause enormous calamities on this earth. The sky is going to roll up like a scroll. I, I can't even imagine that. The space rolling up like a scroll. But that's part of the characteristics of the rakia. Now God uses this rakia in multiple ways. And even though we can't see it, others have um, looked at this and said, well, we know what the rakia is and we know what the verses say about its characteristics and what can happen to it. And one Jewish rabbi from Spain in the Middle Ages, Nachmanides, said he believed that there were ten dimensions and so do the particle physicists. They know, like Einstein for example, knew there's a lot more than the three spatial divisions, height, width, and depth, and time. So we got four dimensions that we are aware of while we live in these bodies. Nachmanides said the other six are curled in those four. We can't see them. We don't understand them. But we know that there's more dimensions. Einstein knew there was more dimensions. That's what he tried to prove with his general theory, relativity, that there's more to hear than what we see. The Bible tells us that, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And I could say to you, when we leave these bodies, we have got a grand revelation coming. It's going to be unbelievable. What we're going to see is going to be nothing, nothing compared to to what God has for us. I mean, I, what we have here, excuse me, is going to be nothing to compare to what God has for us. It's going to be unbelievable. And the people that have spent their lives studying physics and trying to understand some of these dimensional properties here have the slightest glimpse, the most brilliant people in the world, and they know that there's something out there. They know there's something more than this. We have God's Word, and He tells us about it. <laughs> he tells us about it. Uh, I've got a few charts to go through this morning with you. Uh, one is this idea of the canopy theory. Uh, we know that there was a canopy, but the, the idea, and, and we have a canopy now. We have a gaseous canopy around the earth now. Uh, if it wasn't here, we couldn't live. So the, these gases are compressed down on the earth at 14.7 pounds per square inch. If your barometer is not moving one way or the other, causing bodily pain. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but the canopy theory says that the atmospheric water shield protected the earth from cosmic radiation. And that cosmic radiation protection, if you will, was one of the factors that led to the longevity of the patriarchs. So the fact that uh, these guys could live so long had a, it, it probably had some effect um, by the canopy that's there. Um, and uh, the folks that study light also say the same things, that not the intensity of the light, but the speed of the light was probably thousands and thousands of times faster than it is now. And again, it's not intensity. Intensity would just burn things up. But the speed of light, which we can't see, 
causes a great deal of change in the living beings that are on the planet. As we know from scripture that during the millennium, the light speed will be increased by sevenfold, and that will cause a longevity of life, greater prosperity. Um, there will be less sin here because Satan's bound. And the kingdom, if you will, is going to have an environment that's going to be real, real similar to the garden. Not quite, but real similar. And the canopy theory also says within that theory that the continental drift occurred from the fractured land masses. And I'm going to touch on that within the hydroplate theory, which we'll look at now uh, regarding how the continents got their shapes. The, uh, the hydroplate theory says, now, now these, are, these are very strongly supported theories. They're not whims or notions. It's a theory. It's a much more developed understanding. <clears throat> Within the scientific analysis of situations, until you get to absolute testing of something in a controlled environment, you've got notions and ideas that develop after a long period of time and study into a theory. So a theory within the scientific community has validity. It's something to be looked at. The hydroplate theory discusses the interconnection of the continents and as the result of the flood <clears throat> assuaging or receding, the water went down into those cavities. The Lord pressed it down into there and this theory says that that's when these continents broke apart and it created a fissure uh, increasing the pressure down there and causing horizontal buckling and eruptions. And I put a picture of the earth with a fractured line running down the uh, eastern hemisphere oceans. Something happened in this chaos. Something happened. The, uh, the flood ended and it had catastrophic effects on the world. Some believe that there weren't even mountains before this or if there were they were very very small. They weren't as large as what we have now and the flood caused the mountains to heighten and the valleys to deepen. And some of those I've listed here, um, the formation of the Grand Canyon, the mountain ranges in the middle of the ocean, submarine canyons, magnetic variations on the ocean floor. Now the level of magnetism or um, if you will gravity on the ocean floor is not equilateral around the earth. It's really strange. I don't know why that is, but people believe that it came from the flood. The chaos that came from the flood was unimaginable to our minds. Even though we believe this, we understand it, we know it happened, we didn't see it. We didn't realize it. We're trusting God for this. I don't I don't believe I, I don't disbelieve at all that this didn't happen. I know it all happened. But until you realize something, you know, you're, you're trusting it by faith, not by sight. And that's how we're asked to live our lives. We trust by faith, not by sight. These are not out of the realm of possibility at all. The coal and oil formations came about, we know, because of the flood, frozen mammoths, fossil graveyards, and the jigsaw fit of the continents Moving on with Genesis, we see that the text goes into a, uh, the location of the ark finally resting, and it says it rested on Ararat. This is the second time in Scripture so far that it talks about a rest. The first time was when God finished the creation. On the seventh day, he rested. And that whole concept of a rest, as we saw before, gets very, very well developed in the Levitical law. The work of saving Noah and his family and the animals was over. Um, the range of Ararat, it stretches between southern Russia, Turkey, and Armenia. Its highest peak now is 17,000 feet. The range consists of what's called dense lava rock known as pillow lava. And it was formed during the flood under the great pressure of the water. After these events, God gave Noah 
a mechanism for evaluating the level of water that was out there before he left the ark. He used two birds. The first one was a raven. And both of these uh, birds have unique characteristics. And he used them to evaluate the level of the water as it receded so that he would know when it was time for him to leave the ark. A raven, which went out first, is a black, unclean bird. And it was officially designated as unclean in the Levitical law, or the Mosaic law. In Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, Job 38, Psalm 147, and Proverbs 30. But uniquely, God still cares for him. He still cares for him. We see this. In Luke 12, 24, when the Lord was saying, don't worry about your circumstances. Look, God even feeds the ravens. He takes care of them. He used them to feed Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 6. Now, one of the reasons that the raven is unclean is that it'll feed off of dead things. A dove won't do that. A dove won't feed off of dead things. Now, the raven will feed off of carcasses it'll eat them the ravens flight to and fro gave Noah an estimation of the uh, air and water level just by the pattern of the flight now a raven prefers to live at somewhat higher elevations not the highest elevation because Mo Moses excuse me Noah could see the tops of the mountains we see that in uh, the fifth verse in the 8th chapter. He could see the tops of the mountains, so he sends the raven out, or, and he wants to know, is this raven going to keep stay out there, or is it going to come back? And it gives him an idea of how far down the waters had receded. And when it didn't return, he knew that the waters had receded somewhat below the highest peaks. The second set of flights, if you will, was a dove. And there, it's a white, clean animal. It's always used as a positive symbol in Scripture. And uh, its indication here was that the flood was almost over. The dove will live at lower elevations than the raven. And uh, it's very clean. It won't feed off the dead bodies. It has to have decent food. It's got to have some, um, some plant life to feed off of. The raven didn't turn, return, and the flood, or excuse me, the, as the waters receded, the dove came back because it couldn't find any place to rest the sole of her foot. There was no land that she was finding hospitable. The doves prefer the valleys to the mountains, and the waters were still so high that she couldn't alight and stop. Each flight, and there were three flights of these doves, had seven days between them. So Noah would wait seven days, send the dove out again to see if it would come back. Well, he sends it out a second time, and she returns with an olive leaf in her mouth. Olives need a higher elevation to flourish. And the dove returned with this. It indicated that the waters had come down some more. So this is like a water level test that he has with these animals. Lastly, the dove goes out a third time and doesn't come back. So he knew then that the water was off the earth. His indicators were proving valid. Finally, the earth was dry and Noah could leave the ark after 378 days in the vessel. He opened the cover, the top, and saw for himself that the earth was finally dry. Now, I've got a chart that I've placed in your notes here that I put together where I've got each event on the left-hand column, the scripture reference, and the month and the day that it happened in Noah's 600th year. 657 years from creation, or 56 years from creation. The number of days is in the fifth column that this event was generating, 
and then a short description of that event, and then a cumulative total of the number of days in the far right-hand column. And I get 378 days. Now, the family entered the ark, and the waters didn't come for seven days. Some people don't count that. They don't count the seven days, so they come up with 370, uh, or 300, yeah, 371 days. But um, <clears throat> depending how you add this up, it's still over 370 days. I, I get 378 because that's the total time they were in the ark. So you may want to use that for future references. And then I put together a, um, a line chart that has the number of years on the horizontal axis and each of the major events of the flood and that timeline identified on each one of those. So it's interesting to see how this all gets laid out. And it was 378 days that they were in that ark. That's a long time with all those animals. You know, most of us think that uh, God must have caused those animals to go into some deep sleep or hibernation of some sort. I can only imagine a huge barn full of all those animals trying to manage it. <clears throat> My goodness, so he must have had some way to minimally feed them and have them be, uh, <laughs> you know, in some domesticated situation. Amen? <laughs>